Well, turn with me to John 16. That's where we find ourselves this morning. We're still working our way through the Gospel of John. And at this point, uh, this is very instructive. It's a didactic that Jesus is giving his apostles an instruction for life because he's going to be leaving. And, you know, that's what good parents do. We give our children instruction for life because they're going to be leaving, right? <laughs> well, at least they should. <laughs> And this will be the last instruction that he gives, and then we'll move into chapter 17, and that is the high priestly prayer, where Jesus is praying for himself, for those who are his, and for us. But it'll take us a little while to get there. But this morning, let's turn there, and we ended off last time in our time together in chapter 16, and we finished where Jesus said in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. That was true, wasn't it? Why couldn't they bear them? Yeah, there, it was an information overload. Their heads were spinning already over all of the things that he said, and some of them were very disturbing for them. And so he said, well, there's other things that we'll sh I'll share with you later, but he'll share those through the person of his Holy Spirit, the person of Christ. And I ended the service at that verse last week because I thought your heads were spinning too. I f shared far too much information with you then. So we'll continue on from there. In verse 13, he said, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So it is the Holy Spirit who will share all of these other things that God wanted to share, Jesus wanted to share with his disciples and to share with us. It would be accomplished through the person of the Holy Spirit. But I thought it would be good for us this morning to dive a little deeper into pneumatology, into the understanding of the Holy Spirit. That's what pneumatology is, a study of the Spirit. Now, when most Christians talk about the Holy Spirit, what aspect of the Spirit do they talk about? The gifts, the gifts of the Spirit, right? That displays an immaturity in an understanding of the Holy Spirit. I just want you to know that. Now, we are not cessationists. What's a cessationist? They believe the gifts have ceased. No, I don't believe that at all. My experience tells me that hasn't happened. I have experienced the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not only did I observe and hear, I myself have received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So they have not ceased. But it's a knee-jerk reaction that someone embraces a cessationist point of view because of the fanaticism that's out there today, right? We have a lot of people who act like religious nuts rather than spiritual fruit. Thank you, Austin. That's exactly right. They're acting like religious nuts rather than spiritual fruit. So where should we be placing the emphasis, beloved? On the fruit of the Spirit. So this week we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Next week I want to do a study on the gifts of the Spirit. But previously we were talking about the work of the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer using those three great prepositions. Remember what they were? Para, where he comes alongside, the Holy Spirit is called in the Greek text, the parakaletos, right? Called, kaletos, para, alongside. He's called alongside. Jesus demonstrated that in that for three and a half years, he came alongside his disciples, instructing them, teaching them, being an example for them and encouraging them, warning them, exhorting them. But then the Holy Spirit, once the individual comes to an understanding, they're convicted of the truth of these things, and they surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. What happens? N, E, N, right? The English, the English word I, N is very similar to the Greek preposition E, N. So in the in experience, would that be more of a description of the action and work and power of the Holy Spirit in the fruits or the gifts? Fruit. Now, I said fruits, multiple, but it's only fruit, singular, isn't it? And what is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, love. love. And so now the Holy Spirit comes within you, and the evidence that you have been justified by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit resides in you, is that you will display spiritual fruit, fruit, obedience. <clears throat> 
I think everybody in my hearing, there's a few faces I don't recognize, but everybody in my hearing right now believes that the scriptures are inspired of God. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Do you believe that the scriptures are infallible? Yes. Yeah. What does that mean? Accurate in everything it intends to teach. Accurate in every precept that it gives. Infallible. Inerrant. What does inerrancy mean? Without error. Without error in the original text. Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament, Greek and the New. It's without error. And therefore, it is... It is what? How come you're the only one who knows that? It's, it's my authority in life, right? It governs over me. How many times have you, I said to you, I don't read the Bible. The Bible... Yeah, yeah. So is that true? Do you believe those four things? Yeah. Now, what is the manifestation or the evidence? Now, some of you guys were here yesterday morning, so don't give it away. What is the manifestation or the evidence of the fact that you believe, truly believe in the authority of Scripture? You'll obey it. That's precisely right. Now, there's a lot of people who claim that they believe in the authority of Scripture. They, they might even believe it's inspired. Few believe it's infallible. Almost nobody believes it's inerrant anymore. But they'll say they believe it's inspired and it's authoritative, yet they're not. They're not obedient. They're not obeying the Word of God. And why is that? Because they're still carnal. They're still a fleshly man, not a spiritual man or woman. Oh, but when the Holy Spirit comes in, he and within you, he brings you to the word of God. He brings you to an understanding. He's the interpreter. He's the author. He's the interpreter. Brings you to an understanding of the word of God. And then he empowers you to what? To, to be obedient. Now, now the, we, we never reach sinless perfection, do we, Austin? No, no. Anybody reach sinless perfection here? No, thank goodness we have some honest people here. No, no. But in every way, in every day, every month, every year that goes by, we're becoming more and more Christ-like. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit and regeneration, salvation, sanctification, right? He is the justifier and he is the sanctifier. The inexperience really speaks of the sanctification process in that the believer would display the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus summed up the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, in two, right? What did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and what? Go do anything you want, because there's a world of things you won't do. There's many things you will do, you must do, if you really love God, and you love one another, right? The in experience. Now, now the third experience of the Holy Spirit, described this way, is what? Epi, epi, where he comes upon. Now, what work of the Holy Spirit would take place when he comes upon the believer? Empowerment. And therefore, you have the tools that you need for ministry, or we call that the, not the fruit, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So you understand that? The end experience is where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, and we live a changed life. You, you cannot be the same. Once that dunamis of the Holy Spirit, that dynamite power of the Holy Spirit dwells within the believer, you cannot be... Now, you may claim to be a believer, but yet you're living like your unsaved neighbor. Therefore, the only conclusion we can come to, liar, 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 pants on fire, right? <laughs> no, your salvation will be demonstrated in your sanctification. That's what we're going to talk about this week, the end, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Next week, we'll talk about the epi where the Holy Spirit comes on the believer for the purpose of giving you the tools or the gifts for the ministry that he has called you to, okay? But don't put the cart before the horse, as so many do today. They place the emphasis, unfortunately, upon the... When they need to place the emphasis upon the... And you yield to the fruit of the Holy Spirit because, the, listen to me, listen to me, the fruit of the Spirit is the seed bed from which the gifts sprout up. You understand? Jesus cannot empower a servant. He cannot. It's that simple. If he can't trust you, he can't empower you. Now, there's a lot of people, as I said, the sensationists embrace that sensationist position because of the fanaticism that's out there. The charismania, right? I mean, it's just crazy, isn't it? Yet, a lot of these folks who claim to have these spiritual gifts are so steeped in sin inappropriate use of the finances of the church, greedy, always it's money, 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 sexually inappropriate, 
in their actions towards others within the church. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Their debauchery, their immoral activity. And they're only driven by the lust of their flesh. Yet they claim to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Was there any church in the, in the New Testament that really displayed that? Who? The church of Corinth. The church of Corinth was a church that professed to have all of these gifts. And everybody was blabbing in tongues on a Saturday morning. And you're all beside yourself. You're all crazy. Yet... You claim to have these gifts, but there's so much sin prevalent among you. Why is that? If you have the Holy Spirit, right? So we're going to talk about the fruit this morning. So maybe turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Let's go there. We're going to go to a lot of scriptures this morning. And so you can write them down. If I go too fast, uh, you can listen to the text later. But I was going to try to cover both the gifts and the fruit today, but that is not possible. God bless you. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus has been instructing his uh, disciples again. This is the Mount of Beatitudes, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. But if you look at verse, uh, let's go to uh, two, 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 two. I'm going to go to verse 15. Is that what somebody said 15? Thank you very much, you know. Hey, I don't have it all together, but all together, we have it all, okay? That, you know, remember that. I don't have it all together, neither do you, but all together, oh, I love you guys. <laughs> Verse 15, beware of false prophets. We don't have that concern today, do we? No. Oh, you've got to be kidding. Wow, wow. Like never before, false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, presenting themselves as something they are not, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their... Mm. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? No. Do men gather figs from thistles? No. Even so, every tree, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire, and therefore by their fruits you will... So what are we called to be? Fruit inspectors. Now, we're, we're going to go to Luke chapter 6 in a minute, so you can go ahead and turn there. But Luke, in chapter 6, previous to this, he's talking about the fact that you should not judge one another. And isn't that what they always tell you? When you're trying to talk to somebody or correct them or give them a word of exhortation because their life certainly does not line up with the word of God, they say, oh, who are you to judge me. Well, I'm, I'm not judging you. I'm just examining your fruit. And your fruit stinketh, right? When I was a kid, you know, uh, believe it or not, in upstate New York, in the Italian neighborhood, Italian Polish neighborhood I grew up in, all of the vendors would come down in a horse and cart. You believe that? Seriously. That's the way it was. They, they, there was a guy who came down and sharpened your knives. The meat man came down. The, the, oh, the bakery. Oh, that's what I, my favorite, you know. But then the man would come with his fruit cart and be yelling his wares along the way. Marshmallow. You know what that is, right? Cantaloupe. Cantaloupe is marshmallow. Watermelon. You know, and, and my grandmother would go down and my mother, and they'd examine the fruit. How do you examine the fruit? You pick it up, right? You make sure it looks so good. Huh? You don't want to look too bad. You want to look good, right? So you look at the fruit, and then what do you do? You squeeze it. You squeeze it. See, is it, is it, is it it's still uh, green or is it, is it getting ripe? And, and then you, ah, and then sometimes you knock on the fruit, right? So you're examining the fruit because you, you don't want to buy bad fruit. Nobody's going to eat it. Hmm? Nothing worse than mushy fruit, right? Overripe fruit. And so Jesus is telling us we need to be good fruit inspectors. If there is an obvious absence of fruit, then what? All you can assume is what? That salvation hasn't occurred. Now, you're not saying they're damned. You're not saying they're lost. All I can say is, you know, I think we need to talk about the cross. I think we need to talk about salvation. We need to talk about the surrender of your sins and your life to God. If there's no fruit, right? But we're not judging on eternal matters. That's God's business. Who knows but God in the end of the matter, correct? All right, so Luke chapter 6. Did I say that? Let's go there. Gives us a little more understanding of this need to examine the fruit. 
as I said, beginning in verse 37 of chapter 6, he's talking about not judging. But here we get down to verse 43, he's talking about being fruit inspectors. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own So how are we going to know whether you're genuine or not? How are we going to know whether you're actually an authentic Christian or not? Just a professor but not a possessor? Christian in name only? How are we going to know the difference? By the fruit of love. Loving God. And if you really love God, you'll love one another. And you'll never violate one another. Oh, it would be the worst thing to possibly do. There would be such conviction and such shame that would come upon you. Now, if that happens, if you have that conviction, that shame, when you are violating one another, that's a wonderful thing. That's, that's proof that you are God's and that the Holy Spirit is at work in you. Now, what should you do? Confess your sin one to another. Not, I don't need to hear all of your sins, but if you sinned against me, that's what I need to hear. And if I've sinned against you, I need to confess that. Don't I, my dear? Did I do anything this morning yet? No, you're okay. Good. <laughs> Don't worry, the day is young. (laughs) Chapter 6, verse 43, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs among thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasures of his. And where do you believe? In your heart. In your heart. That's where God wants to make the change. That, that's the difference between living a life in the charisma or the charismata of the Holy Spirit and just having joined a cult. What's cult mean? The technical definition of cult? The observance of a religious system. Cult is simply, the, the pure definition of a cult is just your observance of a religious system. And therefore, you have the spirit of religion. Religion. Now, there's a lot of people who have a religious spirit, right? They're just, they're just living according to some observances of this religious system that they embrace, but they're finding a very difficult time being moral. And most often, the fruit, well, it's not really fruit that's displayed, is frustration and anger and resentment. It's not the joy, the inward cheerfulness, rest and peace that should be demonstrated in the life of the believer. So everyone has to ask themselves, am I really living life in the power of the Holy Spirit, a charismata, or am I living according to a cult that I've joined, a religious system? Most people today who have gathered together on this day in this nation are cultists. Am I a liar? Most of you think I'm a liar. Does anyone think I'm a liar? Why? Why? How do you know that what I'm saying is true? Observation. Listen with your eyes. And listen, wives, you're submitting to your husband? Have you? (laughs) Do we need an Ephesians 5 lesson this morning? No. (laughs) Remember, Remember that day? Remember that day, December the 6th, 2008, we were standing here. I was holding your hands, you were holding mine. We were looking with love into our eyes, and then you said, So what? To him? No, not to me. Who are you submitting to? To God. How's it working out, ladies? Good. (laughs) And you know, as God is my witness, you're wonderful. You are. No, no, seriously. I mean, we, it was a little rough in the beginning, wasn't it? Oh, man. <laughs> you know, somebody's going to hurt someone. <laughs> but, but boy, it's really smoothed out, hasn't it? Isn't it? Oh, it's just. Now, how, listen, how long does it take for a marriage to smooth out? Seven to ten years. Seven to ten years. Well, we, <laughs> was it 10 or 11? I'm a little hard headed. No. Husbands. Living a self-giving, sacrificial life towards your wife, your family. How's it working out for you, fellas? There's a work in progress. <laughs> now, now listen to me. To, to the degree that you're not obedient to the Word of God in any of those areas, but, but uh, there's a lot of marriages represented here, and most of them, if I had to grade you, hmm, you wouldn't want me to grade you. I know too much. 
and don't tell me any more. Okay? I know more than I want to know. Right? But let me tell you something. Start submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit in your marriage. She cannot live without what? Love. Love. And I cannot live without? Respect. That's the way God wired us. I need to do a marriage class. Would anybody like to do a marriage class with me? Yeah, let's do a marriage class. Okay, we'll do it in October, in the fall. I just can't get away from it. Why? Because it's such a desperate... Well, you know, we might be gone. Yeah. And, and we'll let Aquila and Priscilla, or maybe we'll let Boaz and Ruth do the marriage class. What do you think? Huh? Wouldn't that be nice? Learn from them? Yeah. Okay, let me get going here. I got a lot to cover. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. Good. You ought to trace this word good throughout the scriptures. And God said that it was? Good. And then he created man and he said it is? Very good. Mucho good, right? Good. Trace good throughout the scriptures, both Old and New Testament. It's a wonderful study. A good man out of the treasure of his heart brings forth the good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth the evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Hmm. Now, John has been talking to us about this spiritual fruit. Turn me to chapter 12 for a minute. John's gospel, chapter 12. Fruitful grain of the wheat is the heading in my Bible in chapter 12, verse 20. Do you have a heading in yours? Some Greeks speak Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Now there were certain geeks. No, Greeks. I'm in John chapter 12, verse 20. You there? Good. You know why we're all here? Because we're not all there. That's right. We need Jesus. Okay. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Proskunos. To turn towards and to kiss. To tell God how much you love him. That's what worship means. It's not a religious observance. It's an expression of your heart towards those him whom you love. What's required to be ready for the rapture? How many good works do I need to do? I mean, what level of perfection do I have to reach in order to be certain I'm going to be raptured? None. What's required? What did you say? It's not a perfection of performance. You can't do it. I can't do it. But the Holy Spirit's working in me. I'm a work in progress. Right? You know, I got my stone all laid out. I just got a chisel in there. Told you I was sick. And put the date. You know. But it is a perfection of relationship that God is looking for. All, listen to me, all he wants to know is this. Is he first in your heart? Now be careful in responding to that. Ask the Holy Spirit where you have not put him in first place in your heart. Jesus wants to take up the space in every area of your life and your heart before any individual, any other relationship, even this really as precious as it, there's, there's no other relationship that is more meaningful to God than a husband-wife relationship where the two become one flesh. The great mystery of which I speak concerning Christ and his church doesn't happen between children and their parents or grandparents and their grandchildren. Get away from that nonsense. You want those little rascals to go out and become everything God wants them to be, Right? But here we have a union, a communion that is supposed to be lifelong and binding, right? But even in this relationship, I have to confess, I came to realize that I made my first wife, Roberta, an idol. Yeah. You're in Gus, too. How many have, how many have come to the realization that your marriage became an idol? Yeah, that's good that you came to that realization, because it can. It can happen very easily, because we, we love them so much. But first in our heart, before any person, any possession, any pleasure, any position, has to be Jesus. And that's all you need to know, is that Jesus is first. And how are you going to know he's first? 
your obedient, your submission to his will. Ah, You understand that the scriptures are authoritative, right? Okay, where were we? John chapter 12, the Greeks. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered and said to them, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. What does that have to do with anything they just shared with him about the Greeks? Hmm. He came for one purpose and one purpose only. He came to die, didn't he? And he came the first time so he could come again. That's right, come again. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He'll be glorified in his death, in his resurrection, and in his ascension. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Anybody have a King James Version? What does it say, Charlene? Fruit. Fruit. That's right, fruit. The better interpretation, now he's speaking of an analogy, an agricultural analogy, where he's talking about grain and the fruit growing, and the fruit of the grain is that, is that grain, the stalk of wheat, I mean, is that grain. But here, the word should be properly fruit. Fruit. So Jesus is mentioning fruit here. Unless it produces fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant, will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So he's talking about this grain having to die and go into the ground, right? But what springs forth is this stalk of wheat, and on this stalk of wheat are are many heads of grain, and that's the fruitfulness. What's required for you to produce spiritual fruit for God? The fruit of love. Die to self. self. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Stop what? Stop living your own life. Mm -hmm. And start living the life that God has for you. You know, you want to make God laugh? What do you do? Tell them your plans. <laughs> tell, them, tell them your plans and make them laugh, right? But, but listen to me. The way God is telling us, Jesus is instructing us that I need to die to my own dreams. I need to die to my aspirations. I need to die to my expectations. And I need to live for the Lord. We all have experienced the death of some expectations or dreams or desires that we have, haven't we? But wait a minute. Those were my desires. Those were your desires. But... But God's will and purposes and plan for my life is far better, isn't it? Far better. Mm. Something has to die in order to produce this fruit. John puts it a little bit milder in John 15. Turn with me there. Now, you know we've been through this chapter, and in this chapter it speaks of the relationship between the fruit, the branch, and the vine, right? That Jesus is divine, and you ain't. You've got to remember that, okay? <laughs> I am the vine, the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I had spoken to you. Now he's going to talk about what they need to abide in as his fruit. They are abiding in him, abiding in the vine. They abide in prayer. They abide in love. They abide in obedience. They abide in joy. All of that, prayer, love, and obedience, will produce such inward cheerfulness and joy. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do... We don't believe that, do we? Look at how much the church tries to do without Jesus. Look at how much the church is trying to do without the Holy Spirit. But it's all flesh. You know, skinny jeans, fog machines, tattoos, woo-hoo. I mean, is it not... And how many of them have crashed and burned? How many of them have fallen? Thank goodness. You know, there's a few more that need to fall because there's a multitude following them. Hmm? How, do we, how do we produce fruit? By living in the vine. By abiding in Jesus. Is he your life? Is your life hid now 
in God, in Christ Jesus? That's the question. And if you're abiding in the vine, all the branch has to do is what? Hold on. Hold on. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Right? (laughs) And and how much work does a branch have to do to produce that fruit? Is he grunting and groaning? What's he doing? Just hanging on. Just holding on. Just resting in him. That's all that's necessary. And who produces the fruit? The vine. The vine. That's the relationship. If you have a strong, loving, abiding relationship with the Lord, you're going to produce fruit. Because it's a natural byproduct. You don't have to strive. And if you're striving, that's not the Lord. Hmm? If anyone does not abide in me, verse 6, he is cast out as a branch and withered, and they gather them up, throw them into the fire, and they shall be burned. Ooh, Ezekiel talks about that. The Revelation talks about that. When's that going to happen? At the end of the age, when everyone is judged, when there's a separation between the wheat and the tares and the goats and the sheep, the true believers and the make-believers. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, and you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So he's talking about abiding in love here. He's talking about abiding in prayer in verse 7, abiding in love in verse 9. And in verse 10, he talks about abiding in obedience. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. How do I experience the love of God? Abide. If my son wanted to experience my love and provision and protection and guidance in his life, all he had to do was obey me. All he had to do was obey Just hang out with me, son. Do what I will for you to do because my highest and best is for you. You. I want to see your highest and best lived out in your life. And if you'll do that, oh boy, we'll have a joyful relationship. And it will produce lasting fruit. He talks about the obedience in verse 10. He's talking about as a result of all of this, abiding in his prayer and love and obedience, you'll have joy. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be fall. Is there a difference between joy and happiness? What's happiness depend upon? Outward circumstances. Having my expectations, my desires, my will met, then I'm happy, but I'm only happy temporarily. That's right, temporarily. Sin is pleasurable. For how long? Just a moment. Just uh, just only lasts a moment. And then it brings forth death. But joy, joy is an internal quality. It's a state of being. It doesn't depend upon my outward circumstance. How is it that all these Ukrainians are manifesting such acts of heroism? The love for the country. And, you know, they're a strong Christian nation. There's a strong Christian belief there. And they're willing to make a sacrifice, the complete sacrifice for those that they love, for the right As the president said, our strength is, no, Zelensky. You're right. From a Christian perspective, our strength is in the Lord. But but he said, uh, the truth, we here in Ukraine are living to the truth, and the truth is our, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. The truth of God's word is our strength. And and will will you live for the truth? Well, listen to me. Now, listen to me closely. I just mentioned a few things. I don't know how well you're in obedience to those things. Just in your relationship with your wife, your husband, your children, your father, your parents, whatever. If you're not living for him in the obedience of those relationships, let me make it very clear. You'll never die for him. Ever. Is that true? This is true. Because you're living a cowardice life now. Live for the Lord. Stop living for yourself. Stop prescribing the agenda of your life and let the Lord lead your life. And he's dictated how we're to live. It is so sweet. It is so simple following the Lord, isn't it? Doesn't sin, doesn't our rebellion, doesn't our disobedience complicate everything? We never have trouble unless 
I'm in rebellion, huh? Unless I'm disobedient. Yeah. That's the only time there's a problem. And how it complicates things. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. For this is my commandment, that you love one another. As I have loved you, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And loving God and loving others will always produce within us joy. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Not take scalps. I used to do that when I was younger as a believer. I had, you know, I produced more, more heat than light in the arguments. Right? And the apologetic I wanted to give, I'm going to prove that I'm right. I'm going to make you a Christian even if I got to grab you by the throat and drag you in. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. No. We don't take scalps, do we? We want him to produce the fruit in our life. Yes, you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things I command you that you love one another. Mm. Now, there are a lot of people who claim that uh, all you have to do is have enough faith, and whatever it is that you want, you'll get. No, you, you have to pray in his name, and to pray in his name, the Johanna epistle makes it clear to us, is to pray in his nature. You pray in his will, and then you'll have the things you ask for, because he, the Holy Spirit, is working within you to pray those very things that he's going to fulfill in your life, and it doesn't get any better than that, does it? And we'll do that tonight. We'll gather together and we'll ask the Holy Spirit to pray through us. Why? Because we not know how nor what to pray. But the Holy Spirit does. How about if we turn to Romans 6, speaking of this spiritual fruit. Romans 6. Now, whenever we uh, do a baptism, I like to use Romans 6 because it talks about the relationship between us and the Lord and that we have to die to ourselves and live for him just as he died upon the cross, so we identify with the death of Christ. And just as he rose to the newness of life, so too we raise to the newness of life as well, don't we? But let's see, where do I want to go in chapter 6? Let's go to verse uh, 15. What then? Shall we sin... Because we are not under law, but under grace, God forbid, certainly not. Perish the thought. Are you out of your mind? But so many today use God's grace as a license for, oh, he'll forgive me. Oh, I do more good than I do bad. Oh, I'll be, no. That's presuming upon the grace of God, and no one ever gets away with that. No, just like Ananias and Sapphira didn't get away with it, did they? In Acts chapter 5, they lied to Peter, they lied to the Holy Spirit. They were presenting themselves as something they were not. And immediately God struck them. What's the difference between then and now? Timing. Hypocrisy will be judged. It's just God is being so forbearing, so patient. But it will be judged if we don't get our lives straightened out with him by yielding to him. Yes, do, not, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether to sin leading unto death or obedience leading unto righteousness. But God, but God be thanked that though we were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading unto more lawlessness, now present your members of slaves of righteousness for holiness. For we were slaves of sin, for when we were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Now, what is he saying? He's saying you couldn't possibly work out any work of righteousness in your life. Your righteousness was absent from you because you were a slave of sin. And the only thing you could produce was the sinful acts of the flesh. But he goes on to say, verse 21, what fruit did you have then in these things for which you now are ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Oh boy, I got so many things of which I am ashamed, but thankfully he's forgiven me. 
And so do you. Hmm? But now, having been set free from sin, hallelujah, and having been slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. What do you want to do? You want to work for what you deserve? You want your wages? Wages in Wages speaks of work, of toil, of labor. What do you deserve from your toil, your labor, your work? Hell, death. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, no, 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 I want the gift. Verse 7, chapter 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband, is bound by the law to her husband as long as she lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she will be free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she is married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also, having been dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that you should bear fruit to God." Previously in the chapter in 6, he talked about the fact that we identify with the death of Christ. Therefore, we are dead to the flesh, dead to the law, dead to our sin, right? You know what the law does. The law simply makes you painfully aware of your need for a Savior, for a rescue, for salvation. Wet paint, do not touch. What's the first thing you do? Stay off the grass. Etc. cetera, 55. 35. <laughs> Gets us all, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's when we were under the law. But now, now why are we dead to the law? Because we're alive in Christ. And the law of the Spirit, Romans chapter 8, has set me free from the law of sin and death. And, and that it, 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 the flesh could, ne I could never win acceptance before God by my exercise of the flesh by my obedience to the law. That's legalism. Could never happen, could it? Could not achieve self-righteousness. I need a righteousness, as Romans would talk about, as Paul would write about, apart from the law, not innate within me, separate from the law, separate from me, the righteousness of Christ. Last week in chapter 16, we learned why the Spirit came. The Spirit came to convince people, to let them know this is the truth. What's the truth? To convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, the, the, the church today loves to talk about righteousness, but, but they're, they're misinformed. They're not talking about the righteousness of Christ. Whose righteousness are they talking about? Oh, don't you know you're wonderful people? You're not born sinners. You're a victim. It was your parents' fault. It was your environment. You were bullied as a child. You're wonderful. Don't you know that? Mm, you're a lot of that gobbledygook, don't you? But you don't hear much about sin and judgment, do you? No. But that's why the Holy Spirit came. That's the purpose of the law, to bring us to the Savior, to bring us to our knees, to recognize what a wretch I really am. Therefore, my brethren, verse 4, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who raised him from the dead, that you should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Don't touch, wet paint, stay off the law, 55, etc., etc. You know what I'm talking about. Verse 6, but now, but now we have been delivered from the law having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You can't possibly keep the law. That's legalistic. And you can't become self-righteous through your obedience to the law, the whole purpose for the law. When Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, the most righteous man in all of Jerusalem, he knew that he was a wretched savior and he wasn't able to keep the law. And he came to Jesus under another pretense, didn't he? Oh, good master. No one can do the things that you do. At least God be with him. And Jesus cut right to the chase. And what did he say? You must be born again, Nicodemus, to inherit the kingdom of God. 
Not in your self-righteousness. You don't have any Nicodemus. And so that's what the, world, that's what the law is trying to prove of, us of. Turn with me now to Ephesians 2, how we are saved. Through this wonderful gift of God's grace and what it produces in our life. Ephesians 2. Verse 1, and you he made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sins. We were dead under the law, but now we're alive to Christ. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And he's really working overtime right now, isn't he? My goodness. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That's not the others we were talking about in Nashville, is it? No, no, no. (laughs) But God, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised up together and made and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm not here. Where am I? You're not here. Where are you? You're in heaven. Seated at the right hand of God the Father in Christ Jesus right now. Isn't that wonderful? It's just a matter of that taking place. But it's a given. Why? Because God says it. Hmm? Yes, a free gift of God. For by grace you have been saved, verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he may show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. How long are we going to be learning of the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God towards us? Forever. As Billy Graham would say, forever. <laughs> forever. Yes. Verse 8. For by grace. God is Mata. You have been saved. So do. Through faith. Pistos. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. The grace gift of faith is what God gives to an individual who he's bringing to salvation. Do you understand that? You didn't seek God. God sought you. You would have never come to him. My flesh is in rebellion to God. My flesh hates the word of God. Does yours? Be honest. It does. It does. God has to awaken me. God has to awaken my spirit to the truth of who he is. Hmm. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, spiritually dead. And the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Isn't that what it says? And so man dies, doesn't he? Hmm. You're, you're like an animal living on an animal plane until you're born again. Right? You're, you're, this is your body and your mind. Your body and your body appetites control all of your Stinking thinking, right? No, that, that's what it is. Listen, when, before I was saved, there was a lot of stinking thinking going on here because of what my body wanted, right? Whether it was drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever the case may be, greed, money, right? I was, I was body conscious, body, mind, body, mind. But the superior trinity wanted to awaken me that I would come alive to his existence and to who he was. The superior trinity is who? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? So then the the Holy Spirit has come. It's needful that I go. That's what he said, right? It is most needful. It's for your benefit that I go. For if I go, I'll send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The Holy Spirit will quicken within you your spirit to live together in communion with my spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I was body conscious, body mind. And then suddenly I got born again. And God gave me right standing. That's what righteousness means. Right standing before him. And now how do I connect to God? How do I know God? How do I experience God? Spirit to spirit. You see that? The superior trinity is now in communion with the inferior trinity. And I relate to him through the spirit, through a life of the spirit, through walking in the spirit, following the spirit, guided by the spirit, inspired by the spirit. I am completely and totally dependent upon the spirit every moment of every day. Are you? Now listen, that's true. That's my wife. She'll tell you. And so should you be. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself, but a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. 
For we are his, and what's that word? Poema, poema. It could be a masterpiece in, in sculpture or a painting, just, just some gorgeous work of art by an artisan. Who's the artisan? And who's the work of art? You are. Now, now, workless faith is worthless faith. Let me put it another way. God bless you, my dear. God bless you, my dear. Double bless. Yes, yes. I'm just, I won't go there. <laughs> it was good, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Workless faith, worthless faith. Fruitless faith is worthless faith. If your life isn't producing fruit, it's because you really don't have saving faith. Saving faith will always, always, always produce fruit. Do you understand? For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of your own, but a gift of God, least that any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, his poema, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he saved you to do what? To walk in good works, to produce spiritual fruit for God, to be his poema, that everybody would look at your life and say, wow, did you see what God did to him? Wow. Her? Wow. You are a child of God. Isn't that what he said to you? Wow. Because our life changes. I go home to my family in New York, they're still shocked. They think I'm a deacon. I don't know how to tell them I'm a pastor. You know? <laughs> Turn to me to chapter 5. Chapter 5 of Ephesians. The heading in my Bible says, walk in love. What does yours say for chapter 5? Walk in love. So we're walking in fruit, right? The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Our life should now be demonstrated by our love. Love, love for God first. I'm not talking about this sentimental, emotional, ooey-gooey kind of thing that the world talks about. That's not love. It's not love if you're not living the truth. It's not love if you're not telling the truth. I love you. And if I know there's something wrong about you, I'm going to tell you. Why? Because I love you. I love you. I don't want to. And I want you to tell me if there's something wrong about me. Just be gentle about it, okay? <laughs> Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given us for an offering and a sacrifice to God as a sweet-smelling aroma. Do you hear that? Not, listen, not only did the Father save us to give us as a gift to Christ, Christ in return gives us back as a gift to the Father to demonstrate his beauty, the sweet aroma of Christ to the world. And that's what we should be, right? But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. You're the hagios, right? Agapetos. Galatos Hegios, the beloved called saints of God. That's what Romans calls us, right? That you were called of God, Galatos, that you, because of his love, Agapetos, and then he wants you to be his Hagios, most holy ones. Now, it's not your holiness, it's his. It's not your righteousness, it's his. It's not your fruit, it's his. But living the Christian life is allowing Jesus to live his life through, uh, through us for the glory of the Father. And people would see the Son. Is that true? Yeah. You need to do a self-inventory, self-examination. <sighs> Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse gesturing, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks, living a thanksgiving life through your thanks living. For this we know, that no fornicator, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of God. Now, we were looking at that previously. Those people who live according to a sinful lifestyle, they're characterized by that. Make no mistake whatsoever, they can't get in God's heaven. They won't. But there's too many people who don't want them to feel uh, like they're judging them or to, to think ill of them, they refuse to tell people the truth. The most loving thing, listen, the most loving thing you can do for those people you really love is tell them the truth. You tell them the truth that if their life is characterized by any sin, any disobedience, any rebellion to God, I don't care what you profess, you're not going to heaven. Is it true? Why is it true? 
because it's in the Bible. It's true because it's in the Bible? Is it true because it's in the Bible? No. It's in the Bible because it's true. That's exactly right. Hmm? There's a good grasshopper over there. Hmm? Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Be very careful, beloved. Listen to me. We're in the age of deceit like none other. You need to test the spirits. You know, in Moses' day, when God was working through the power of the Holy Spirit through Moses in ecstasy, right? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would work through wind, uh, through the breath of God, and through ecstasy, right? Where he would empower men for certain gifts. But the one thing that... Could, 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 could the Old Testament saints be saved through the work of the Holy Spirit? No. I'm sorry, who said that? Why do you say that, angel? Well, no, what'd you say? <laughs> could, could Old Testament saints be saved through the work of the Holy Spirit? But the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit came upon Samson. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul. The Holy Spirit came upon Elijah. Right, right. It was it, the Holy Spirit then was used for acts of ecstasy or miracles that God was desiring to perform through the individual, or it was the spirit of prophecy or eschatological prophetic utterances. That's how the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. He was empowering people for, to accomplish the will of God at that particular time through that particular individual. But how was one saved in the Old Testament? Faith. Faith in what? What promises were that? Okay, what, what else? The whole, the whole Levitical system. You had to believe that God was going to give you a temporary righteousness or a kafar, a covering for your sin through the sacrificial system, which all pointed to the coming of the Messiah. You would receive righteousness through faith, and that faith would be demonstrated in obeying the law of Moses, particularly the sacrificial system, because you couldn't be perfect, could you? But through the sacrificial system, what would happen? Your sins would be temporarily kafar, covered, until the Christ. And then there was a complete... Remission of the sins, right? Yeah, please understand that. And there is no purgatory. You understand that? There's no purgatory. W where did the whole idea of purgatory come from? Okay, but where did they get it from? Yes, from, from the belief of Hades or Sheol. Sheol in the Old Testament is Hades in the New Testament, mankind's common grave. Before Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a perfectly sin-free life, died for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended unto the Father. Every single person who died, whether you were a believer or unbeliever, went to mankind's common grave, Sheol or Hades. Now, there were two compartments there, one for the unrighteous dead. It wasn't comfortable at all, but the worst is yet to come. But then there was a place for the righteous dead, which we call paradise or Abraham's bosom. Why? Because that's what Jesus referred to it as. When he gave the parable of the, of the beggar going into Abraham's bosom, being comforted, and the thief on the cross, he said, today, this day, you will be with me. And I couldn't have been heaven. Why? Because he was, go he was going to Hades, to Sheol, to preach to the righteous dead for three days. And then he would be resurrected, and he would be seen on earth for how long? Then he would ascend. And when he ascended, what did he do? He emptied that place out called paradise or Abraham's bosom. No one is there any longer. Christ was the firstborn among many brethren. He's the one who made entrance into heaven that made it possible for all of us. So in the Old Testament, there was a righteousness that would be received, a salvation that would be received temporarily until the Messiah would come and fulfill all of the promises God made. And your man, the demonstration that you believed all of that was your obedience in the sacrificial system. You understand? So the Holy Spirit didn't save in the Old Testament the way he saves today, right? Where did I say to go? For we were once in darkness. Verse 8, thank you. But now we are light in the world. <laughs> Jesus said that, didn't he? In the Gospels, Matthew, Luke. You alone are, you alone are the salt of the earth, right? Yeah. For you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. 
for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. No, that's the way we're to live our life. Not seeing how, how much sin you can get away with because that's just not possible. Only today, only today does the church believe that you can have a saved soul and a lost life. Hyper grace. Hyper grace. That's what it is. Maybe he should preach next week. <laughs> Hyper grace. That's what we call it, you know. Don't I wish I were where you are when I was your age? Yeah. Isn't that true, beloved? Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Hyper grace, we call it. And so many are embracing it today, living like lost people and falsely believing they have a false sense of spiritual security. They have fire insurance only. If you think a person is 99% saved, then what? They're 100% lost. If you think a person is almost saved, partly saved, I'm not sure they're 100% lost. Make no mistake about it. My salvation will be demonstrated in my sanctification, my living for Christ. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. The writer of Hebrews says, let us have great, great, great grace. You know what great grace produces? Great grace by which we may serve God reverently, acceptingly, and with a godly fear. Why? For our God is convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. That's what great grace produces. Unfortunately, today, most people believe great grace produces an old grandfather who is so loving, so accommodating, he winks at all of our sin. Isn't that true? Not so. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See that you walk circumspectfully, very, very carefully, like in enemy territory, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine. There's a lot of whining going on in the church today, isn't there? It's crazy. God saved me from drinking, not to drink. Very dangerous. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. You're out of control, debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. And, and this is an ongoing process. Be continually being filled. What's gas this morning? Three what? 359. Oh, wow. 332 at Walmart on West Georgia Road. Don't, don't you wish you could take that SUV and just fill it one time? Be done with it? Huh? They say there's enough energy in a tree to run a city for a year. Well, well how about my car? <laughs> but we constantly have to fill it up in order to use it, right? You're going to run it, you're going to exhaust the energy, and you're going to have... Well, the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Listen, we're not called to be pew potatoes and just take it in, take it in, take it in, and have no outlet. That's the Dead Sea, right? But we want to be the Salad Sea of Galilee. We want to be alive. We want to have an inlet and an outlet. Yes, living waters. And you would constantly have to be being filled. It's, it's a constant refreshing and a filling of the Holy Spirit. The more you give away, the more you receive. You'll never diminish the supply that God wants to give you of his power, his work, his spirit, his love, his compassion, his patience. We get hurt, don't we? Don't we? In the process of serving God. I have never, ever, ever been hurt so much in my corporate career, 26 years at General Electric, I have never, ever been hurt to the extent in my corporate career that I've been hurt in the church by Christians. Anybody else ever experienced that? But we should never, ever quit. We should never give up. We should never stop loving. Do you understand? You stop loving, you lose. Right? And the enemy wins. We're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. Get over it. Put on your big boy pants. <laughs> C. 
See that you walk circumspectfully. This is like a, a warrior in enemy territory trying to go through there at night. You know, it, it takes a warrior about an eight-hour period to go through a mile in enemy territory. That's what he's talking about here. Walking very, very carefully, very wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Hey, all you have to do is make a joyful. It don't have to sound good. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Austin and I were together the other day, and you, you were making noise. That's all. Just a lot of good noise. Didn't sound good, but it was noise. <laughs> I like to make, you like to sing? Yeah, I wasn't a singer until I got saved. And I, I, I can't stop singing. Is that true? I wake up singing. I just love to sing because of the joy the Lord has put in your heart. And that's what happens to spiritual men and women. They have a song in their heart constantly. And even when we experience those difficult times in life, Job tells us he does what? He gives us a song in the night, right? Yeah giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Well, we can't talk about fruit of the Spirit until we go to where? Galatians Galatians 5. That's right. Let's turn there. Now, you you know that uh, Paul is talking to the Galatian church about the fact that they're they're being bewitched. Chapter 3, he says, who? Who has bewitched you? What is this demonic, satanic influence you've been under that having begun in the spirit, are you now going to, you're going to perfect yourself in the flesh? You think you can win approval to God now by what you, listen, God doesn't save you and then say, Pam, hope you keep yourself saved. Is that what he says? Hmm? Does he say, no, 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 no. He doesn't, he doesn't save us, justify us, and then say, well, I got you started. Matthias, you're on a good road now. Stay there, buddy. You need to keep yourself saved. And how do you keep yourself saved? Good works. You got to obey the law. You got to keep the law. God could never honor the works of our flesh. What's that wonderful Old Testament story that he gives us? Which one? Abraham had two sons. One of the flesh of the bondwoman and one of the promise, right? Who was the first? Ishmael, right? And who was the second? Isaac, Isaac. And God said to Abraham, take now thy son, thy only son, Ixach, right? The son of the spirit, the son of promise, not the son of the flesh. God will never honor your work in the flesh. Hey, look what I'm going to do for you today, (laughs) right? God, work through me today for your glory. Use me, Lord. That's what he's saying here. So, so the Galatians, they were going to perfect themselves by, and they were Gentiles. They were wannabes. How many Gentile wannabes do we have today in the Messianic movement? You know, most of the Messianic congregations in the country, you know, they're predominantly comprised of? Gentiles. The Messianic church here in uh, Greenville, it's predominantly Gentile. Why? Well, you got all these Gentile wannabes, Right? My friend, Rabbi Myerson, Andy Myerson, you've met Andy before, I think. He says, they think they're more Jewish than I am. (laughs) It's crazy. So they go back to the law. No, 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 no. That's what the Galatians were doing. What law were they going to obey? Circumcision. Circumcision save you? No. Hey, I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Peter. I was baptized by, does baptism save you? No, no religious observance will ever save you. But that's what they were believing foolishly. They're simply signs, symbols of of, of the reality of Christ working in our life, right? Communion doesn't save you. Baptism doesn't save you. Circumcision certainly doesn't save you. And Paul is addressing that. Who has bewitched you and you're believing now that you can perfect yourself in the energy of your flesh? I met a young man not too long ago who said he never sins anymore. Yeah, no, that's what he said. He was very bold about his proclamation. I don't sin anymore. I am not a sinner. I said, oh boy, let me get away. <laughs> Lightning's about to strike. <laughs> so Paul is addressing their desire to go back into a legalistic lifestyle, which is death. 
and it doesn't produce joy. Why? Because if you try to win approval before God by the works of your flesh, he's going to back away and let you fail over and over and over again. And then what happens is the hypocrisy in your life just swells. And it's that very thing that I've been talking to you about where, where there's that public persona, right? You got pants on? You, I'm talking to you. You're wearing pants in the house of God. And, and why don't you gentlemen have a suit going on? Now, the outward observances, they believe, brings them a greater righteousness or closeness to God. Nothing could be farther from the truth. But in those legalistic environments, what's the atmosphere like? Judgmental. What? Yeah, you're walking on eggshells, it's legalistic, it's judgmental, it's cold, it's hard-hearted. Lacking love, lacking the expression of compassion and love. And, and what, why, why is all of that taking place? Because of that disparity between the public persona they're trying to present. I was attending a church in Greenville before this church started, and this is way back when, when uh, this was 1989, 1990. Leisure suits were in then. Remember those? So, so on Sunday morning, I was going to this church and everybody wore a suit and tie. So I wore a suit and tie. I mean, I had a closet full from my business career. But on Sunday nights, I wore a leisure suit. You know, it was Sunday evening. Relax a little bit. Mm-mm-mm. One of the elder's wives came up to me and she looked me up and down. She said, nice of you to dress for church. It wasn't long that church gave me the left foot of fellowship. It was an interesting story, but, <laughs> but, but what, it, what it produces is such hypocrisy because they're, they have this public persona that they're trying to present, right? But then there's this shadow person that is so miserable because they're living outside of the will of God. They're living outside of the fruit of love. And the, and the more that takes place, the wider the gap gets and the angrier and the more discontent and the more hateful and pretty soon, these people walk away from the faith. And there's nobody want to be around. They drink vinegar, you know. I don't mean anything by that. So apple cider vinegar and honey is very good for you. <laughs> <laughs> you with me? So verse 16 of chapter 5 of Galatians. I say then, so he's going to counter all of this. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life everlasting, he would say. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they are contrary one to another, so that you not do the things that you wish. Paul talks about living this life in the flesh, the first seven chapters of Romans. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will save me? Or the will that I, the good that I will to do, I do not, and and that which I will not to do, I do. Who is going to save me? What does he say? Christ Jesus, my Lord, and then he begins chapter 8. And what is the emphasis of chapter 8 in Romans? Finally, after seven chapters of of showing the world how lost we are, whether you're having the spirit of religion or whether you're just a heathen, you're lost, you're damned, you're condemned, you're an anathema to God. But then in chapter 8, who does he emphasize? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the living life and the power of the Spirit. Who will save me, O wretched man that I am? God. And how does he do it? Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Beautiful. But if we are led by the Spirit, we are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. This uncleanness covers everything that's going on with this gender dysphoria today and this transgender craziness. Lewdness, uncleanness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who lives are characterized, practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Isn't that true? There's a lot of people who are hearers. I just don't see many doers. 
And who are they deceiving? Their own selves. You're not seeing, deceiving God. God, God, your sin, God will not be mocked. Your sin will find you out, right? Yeah. These mega churches, they need to hire me for a couple weekends. They won't have any parking problems. <laughs> but the fruit, fruit singular now. This is, this is the fruit. The fruit is love, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What was the way? The way of agape. 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 We'll see that in a minute. I think we get no, quickly. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, speaking of our relationship to God. I wanted to go into a lot more detail with this, and I can't right now. I'm running. No, we'll finish this next week. There's too much I want to share. This is wonderful. This is, this is, the, this is the fruit of it all. <laughs> this is the joy of it all. Living a life in the Spirit. When we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, we'll talk about that next week as we finish the fruit of the Spirit. When you talk about the gifts of the Spirit, where would you find the most exhaustive uh, uh, instruction on the gifts? First Corinthians where? 12? No, not 13. 12 and 14. He, fit, he ends chapter 12 in speaking about the gifts of the Spirit, and particularly one that's completely out of control, which was tongues. About the alia. He says, can I show you a more excellent way. the way of love? The way of agape, the way of love. The whole chapter 13, the love chapter. Wait, listen, we, we got the horse before the cart. You have to allow God to work through you in loving him and loving one another. I need to learn to love more. Lord, you need to work through me so that I love you and I love my wife and I love this church more than I love myself. <sighs> I remember talking to someone who was in sin that I love and I said, you, you, you don't understand it. Don't you believe I love God? Don't you believe I love God? That's what they kept saying to me and right in my face. I said, yes, I believe you love God but it's evident you love yourself far more. That should never be, beloved. You will know them by their fruits. And the chief fruit of the Spirit is love. True love, biblical love. Amen? Shall we stand? Pastor David?